Good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing? All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, today is Pitch Local, presented by J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Uh, we are so excited to be able to represent the breadth and depth of early stage entrepreneurs from across the region. Uh, today we have featured women's entrepreneurship, veteran entrepreneurship. We have even had a sixth grade class join us from Sacred Heart Academy. So it's been a dynamic day. Uh, but we're closing out the day with a very special keynote. Uh, to introduce that speaker, I'd like to welcome Patty Riddlebarger, Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at Intergy Corporation, our sponsor for this session and a much appreciated partner of New Orleans Entrepreneur Week. With that, I'd like to bring up Patty. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here today. Um, and I'm thrilled for so many reasons. I'm gonna go over just, just a couple of them. 12 years ago, Antrogy was one of the very first corporate sponsors to invest in a little startup called The Idea Village. I like to feel personally that our partnership has played a small role in the transformation of New Orleans into a national hub for innovation and entrepreneurship and has helped give birth to New Orleans Entrepreneur Week and bring all of you here today. And the second reason I'm particularly excited about this session and so psyched to introduce our speaker is because compassionate capitalism or doing well by doing good is at, literally at the heart of Entergy's mission. Our mission is to operate a world-class energy business and create sustainable value for each of our stakeholders. So you're gonna be hearing more about that, but I also literally jumped at the, state, at the opportunity to share the stage with a woman who is a national thought leader and the creator of the Pledge 1%, which you'll also be hearing more about in just a moment. But first, as the session sponsor, that means I get to give a commercial. So, you know, and now a word from our sponsor. Um, Entergy chose to sponsor this session because it lines up so well with our corporate mission and the values of our company. We're a Fortune 500 company. We're the only ones headquartered here in New Orleans. We operate a wholesale power generation and integrated electric distribution business in seven states. And I'm happy to say that we've been a 1% company since 2005. As a utility operating in a non-deregulated retail market, the only way that we can be successful is if the communities that we serve are healthy, vibrant, and growing. We create sustainable value for our communities through philanthropy, volunteerism, and advocacy. Last year, our shareholders donated more than $19 million to almost 3,000 organizations in communities that we serve across the United States. Our employees logged over 100,000 hours of volunteer service. And I can tell you from personal experience that the principles of compassionate capitalism work. For our business, it's not a luxury, and it's not something that we do when earnings are up and dial down when earnings are down. It's baked into our core values and our business operations. And we measure the return in sales, organizational health, employee engagement, retention, cost reduction, regulatory climate, stock performance, brand, and recognition, reputation. So it's not just theory that you're gonna be hearing about today, but real life practices that actually work in the business world. All right, commercial over. Now it's with great pleasure that I introduce Suzanne DiBianca, Executive Vice President of Corporate Relations and Chief Philanthropy Officer of Salesforce. Under Suzanne's leadership, Salesforce pioneered the 111 model of integrated corporate philanthropy, which dedicates 1% of Salesforce equity, employee time, or product back into the community. Today, Salesforce serves as a successful model for corporate social responsibility with hundreds of companies adopting this through Pledge 1%. You can read Suzanne's bio in the program, but I did a little digging and wanted to share a couple of nuggets that provide some additional perspective. Suzanne's father was a businessman. Her mother ran the Department of Juvenile Justice for the state of New Jersey. Like most working moms, Suzanne's mother brought her work home with her, but this was a little different. What that meant for Suzanne's family is that they often shared their home with children who were very different from her background and that of her neighbors. That experience opened her eyes at a very young age to the reality that life is often not kind or fair. So between the capitalist and the social worker, Suzanne likes to say that she ended up in the middle. That foundation is one of the factors that shaped Suzanne and guided her to the role that she has today. 
Suzanne designed the approach to integrated corporate philanthropy that has helped build Salesforce into the company that it is today. But that's not all. The company also addresses philanthropy and advocacy on social justice issues in, such as gender equity, LBGT rights, and discrimination in all of its forms, not just within the company, but also within the society as a whole. And that is boldly going where few companies have gone before. Suzanne has been named one of the 50 most powerful women in philanthropy, as well as a Hall of Fame member of the San Francisco Business Times most influential women in the Bay Area. She's also a pioneer in what has been called the next big wave of tech philanthropy. I can't wait to hear all about it, and I know you're all on the edges of your seats as well. So please help me give a very warm New Orleans welcome to Suzanne DiBianca. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Belikov. Can you hear me OK? OK. I'm a, uh, a freelance business journalist. My credits include Entrepreneur Magazine, Forbes, Success, uh, and a few others. I'm also a book author. My next book will be out later this year called Strategy. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, and it's my honor to interview Suzanne today for you and to leave some time at the end for Q&A as well. Um, so uh, hopefully, we will get there within 30 to 40 minutes, sure. and there'll be some great questions at the end. Um, you are impressive. Yeah. You, you, Not really. Uh, yeah, I know. You don't like to, yeah. We don't like to think of ourselves in those terms, but there probably are a lot of people in the audience that feel like you're, you know, you're somebody. You're not just another corporate executive, but you represent something bigger to them. My, uh, my outcome for today, if we have one objective, it would be that by the end of today's talk, at least one entrepreneur in the room, someone who is either leading a startup or is getting ready to move in that direction, will seriously consider and adopt a 1-1-1 model, which is what we're going to get to today. Yeah. But before we get there, um, I want to ask you, why did you want to be a part of New Orleans Entrepreneur Week? Yeah, thank you. And hello. Nice to meet all of you um, virtually. And I think uh, just to answer the question about why be part of this week, I think for two reasons. One, um, because I've been spending a lot of time this year in particular working with entrepreneurs uh, all over the country, all over the world, really, and trying to dispel the myth around philanthropy as being hard or something that you have to wait to do till you've reached that comfortable level of success. So I've been kind of pounding the pavement on that message all over um, the world in that. And the second is, uh, and then I, I kind of fell backwards into this, which is one of our partners, Silverline, um, and Jill's over here, brought a great team along with Kai, who's an uh, employee of Salesforce, who after Katrina have been working with Idea Village for seven years and doing a super cool project, working with nonprofits and getting them up on technology. And so I unfortunately wasn't able to be there on Sunday, but um, it was a, it's just a great example of our model in action. So I've, looked, I've wanted to learn a little bit more about it and be here to support some of it. Yeah, have you had a chance to experience New Orleans? Yes, so far. I've only been here. I haven't been here that long. But uh, it's great to be back. We were, we were talking earlier, and Suzanne mentioned that before she knew it, it was 2 in the morning. You were out with friends, <laughs> and New Orleans has that, that impact on, on people. On a Sunday night. Yeah, yeah. and I'm yeah. sure, you know, based on the successes that we're seeing, uh, with a lot of the entrepreneurial efforts here, staying late at work is pretty easy too, I'd imagine. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So take us back a little bit. I want to take you all the way back to high school. We heard a little bit in the opening about your uh, your childhood coming up in a in a family where we're giving back and being a part of community was really important. How did you get from high school, literally, to where you're sitting here today? What were the major influences that said to you? Philanthropy, community, giving back is going to be my life's work. Um, thank you for the question. And it's P Patty did a great job in terms of sort of researching that. I kind of forgot about the um, kind of intersection of capitalism and social justice in my own, in a way, sort of unconscious intent around a career. But I wish I had some very clear story of kind of studying this stuff in college and, you know, apprenticing and working. 
The truth is I really fell into it, and I'll just, um, just tell a quick story, which is I, so I went to University of Colorado. I, I grew up in New Jersey, um, and I went to University of Colorado. I was the only one I knew who left the town that I was from, and uh, we, we share that sort of bolder history. And moved out to San Francisco, fo followed a guy, quite frankly, and uh, sold shoes in Fisherman's Wharf with my college degree. So, what did you major in college? <laughs> I was a communications and econ major. Okay. So I did not sort of sign up for the um, the internship program. In fact, I didn't really even know you could. I just kind of wanted to move to. I kept going west. So I was selling shoes, um, and I was a. Safeway, which is our local grocery store, and right in front of me in line was a very pregnant woman. And she was talking to her friend about how she uh, hadn't found somebody to cover her maternity leave. Mm. And she was really nervous about it, and I just kind of tapped her on the shoulder and said, sorry for listening into your conversation, but what do you do? Um, and she, she said, well, I run this nonprofit, and it was in the 90s, and it was shortly, maybe five, 10 years after the, the wall had come down in Berlin, and she said, I do, uh, I, wor I work for this little nonprofit, and I do conflict management in Central and Eastern Europe. And I said, well, that sounds awesome. <laughs> so sign me up. So I basically started my career in a little nonprofit in San Francisco. Wait, so you, you literally scored this opportunity to help her on her maternity leave? Yes. At a safe way at a gross, line. That's right. Okay. So if you ever, if you're looking for a job, like keep your eye on the super pregnant people because <laughs> they always need coverage. Right. Um, and so yeah, that's how I scored the job. Like I don't, that's why I don't have the resume sort of story, right? Sure. And I worked at this great nonprofit. I thought, uh, like any nonprofits, how many people here work for nonprofits? So you guys know the drill, right? You do everything. You do fundraising. Like, I did fundraising. I wrote proposals. I did finance. I did marketing. I, you know, I did everything. As you know, you have like 19 million jobs usually when you work for a small nonprofit. So I learned a lot actually about how NGOs and businesses work, and um, then went into management consulting actually with my sort of conflict management, alternative dispute resolution skills, and I worked for a small a management consultant in San Francisco, and ended up doing dispute m resolution mostly with VPs and budgets, which got really old really quickly. I imagine it would, yes. yeah. Um, and I thought I was going to go back to business school, and I ended up actually sort of getting an MBA through this management consulting gig. We got bought by a large company called CSC. Um, I, when we were in this small boutique firm, I kind of ran our foundation at night just as a volunteer. Mm. And I just saw the power that it had on building a cool culture in a company. And so when we were acquired by CSC, like a good consultant, I went in with a 70 page deck that said, you know, why this is good for business. And they all kind of nodded off in the meeting. And the first page said, I, you shouldn't need the other 69 pages of data. We should do this because it's the right thing to do. And they kind of nodded off. Uh, I was like, where am I? And I, I knew that wasn't the kind of company that I wanted to work for. And that next day, actually, I had breakfast with a friend and I said, I think I want to run a foundation. And I've just been doing all these technology implementations. And so I'm kind of interested in the tech sector. And uh, she had dinner with Mark Benioff that night, and he said, I think I want to start a foundation. And Mark is? The CEO of Salesforce. And so she said, I had breakfast with somebody who wants to run a foundation. So she got us together, and the rest is sort of history. So you caught that foundation bug working for the consulting firm. Yep. And that took you in the direction that you've been in for 15, 20 years now? Yep. Somewhere in that direction. 17 years. Yeah, okay. and I always did a lot of volunteer work on the side. I was a mentor. I yeah. did a lot of work through college and, yeah. Got it. So to help uh, frame today's conversation, I'd like to share some figures that are related to giving. Um, and there's a lot of them, so pardon me for, for reading off of the sheet of paper. But in, uh, in 2014, individual giving was pegged at around $265 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, in that same year, foundation giving around $60 billion charitable bequests um, around 32 billion, and at the bottom of the list was corporate giving at 18.45 billion, which to be fair was an increase of 3.9% over the previous year. 
Uh, my question here is, what role should those folks that are here today thinking about starting a company, those that already have businesses, what role should entrepreneurs play in this broad landscape of social change that these dollars are going toward? And should the business community, this, uh, this group that's pegged at corporate giving, really be last on the, last on the ladder? And if so, why? Yeah, it's, it's actually good that it increased last year because it had, it had stayed flat in the great economy for like eight years. Mm -hmm. I think overall, um, I don't think it's, I think cash is the hardest. Cash is the hardest for entrepreneurs. Cash is the hardest for publicly traded companies. The, the real assets in a company are the people that work there, the products that they have, and um, their ability to sort of advocate for change on policies and a number of other things. So I think cash plays a role if it's leveraged with those other things. And we'll, we can talk, if you want, later a little bit about sort of how we think about that. But I, whenever people come to me to ra raise money, nonprofits come to me to raise money, I always say, you know, what you do is amazing, but 92% of your prospects are not in this room. So I would not recommend you spend a lot of time chasing corporations around for money because you know they're less than 10% of overall giving. They got assets for you, and those are worth, they're valuable. But cash is, I think, um, you know, you see that more and more, at the, that's the role of sort of private philanthropy. So is this why Salesforce, for example, developed the one 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 model? Did you find early on when the company started that foundation that you were constantly being approached for giving, which to most people meant dollars, and you knew that there was something else that you could give. So if you could, uh, just talk us through the, the beginnings of what was called Salesforce 111. Right. And, and what are those ones, and why was that developed? Yeah, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the beginning of Salesforce, because it kind of plays into the 111 model. So, so you gotta remember, when I started, the company was 50 people big. We're now 25,000 people around the world. So for a 50-person company to sort of hire somebody full-time to run philanthropy was a big, in and of itself, was a massive give, right? So, and vision. So the CEO of our company said, I want to revolutionize the industry. I want to build this three-legged stool. Uh, one was software provided over the internet, which in 2000 was like unheard of. It was the days you were still getting like AOL CDs in the so mail. So this notion of software as a service. Software as a service, yeah. right? People thought we were nuts. Uh, he also said, I'm gonna do it as subscription based. And in those days you would do massive upfront implementations for software uh, solutions, 80% of which would fail. So he said, we're gonna do this like a magazine, right? So if you like it, you keep paying. People also thought we were nuts. And then he said, and I'm gonna build a new philanthropy model. So that was our sort of three-legged stool, new technology model, new business model, new philanthropy model. And he said, the new philanthropy model is something that I wanna bake into the startup process of the company so that you, can, it's, you can't take it out ever if you, even if you wanted to. Uh, and I wanna figure out how to use our assets to make social change. And I was like, right on, this is the guy I wanna work for. And what I did in the first year or two was kind of scan the industry. And I looked at great companies in this space like Cisco and Levi's and Hasbro. And I kind of smashed all their models into a brand that somebody could remember. So Cisco has always been awesome on product donation. Um, Hasbro has always been really good on volunteerism. And equity, we actually learned from eBay. And I can tell you how that works a little bit. But e eBay was the first one who did the equity yeah. set aside. Yeah. yeah. And so we, and, and my boss is the kind of killer branding genius. And he said, oh, well that's one, one, one. That just means we take 1% of our time, 1% of our profit, uh, and 1%, in, in our case it was equity, because we weren't profitable. I, I could see Mark just product. like literally standing in front of your desk and going, oh yeah, that's one, one, one. Right. No, no uh, marketing firm coming up with it. No. Just all organic. Yep. right there on the spot. And I, of course, was like, that's not enough. 1% is not enough, I do not want to be there. And there was other 1% sort of initiatives. You didn't suggest 666, did you? <laughs> I okay, didn't. just checking. <laughs> I didn't, but- It's a slippery uh, slope at He some got, point. it is a very slippery slope. Yeah. And he said, when we're talking about 1% equity, I'm telling you, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, because of his vision, where he saw this going. Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and 1%, actually we do 2% of employee time, we give six pay days, which if you actually do the math, now we give seven pay days. If you do the math, that ends up being 2% of working time that's paid. Um, but we figured about 50% of the people would actually do it, and we wanted to get to the goal, so we doubled it. Okay. And we've always been higher on the product. We've always been around 5 8% of donated so customers. So did, did this start, did this uh, look at volunteerism, donation, equity? Did this literally start with when you were between 50 and 100 employees? Yeah. Or did you wait until you scaled much larger to really kick it in? Uh, no, we started with um, when we were 50 to 100 people. In fact, I hired two people. In fact, I got there and he said, here's your first employee. And I said, that's terrible. Don't I get to choose my first employee? And he said, no, this woman's amazing. And she runs education out of Atlanta and I'm moving her here. And she's great. Her name was Julie Trell. She's, um, and she's worked a, with a lot of startups now in helping them kind of implement it. But we started to work after schools and after school programs. It was sort of back in the days where E-rate was sort of new, which was a uh, way to get technology into the schools, but it wasn't happening in the after school programs. So that's kind of where we started. So let's jump ahead a little bit. We've talked about this thing called 111. Let's go pretty deep in terms of defining it. And now there's a there's another organization. There was salesforce.org. Yep. And now there's an organization called Pledge 1%. Yep. So Pledge 1% um, was recently pegged as the number 43 on the on fast companies list of the most uh, innovative companies in 2017 and number 1 in the not-for-profit space. Yeah. So help me make that bridge between salesforce.org, which you were running, yep. um, pledge 1%, and then break down this 111 for us. What are each of those areas? And uh, I'm gonna ask you to give me an example of each of them in play as well. Sure. Not using Salesforce. Okay, great, even better. So the way that it came about is, and the founding companies of pledge 1% are Salesforce, a company called Atlassian, who builds developer tools. Uh, a is, great is HipChat one of their products? HipChat's one of their products. Yep. Uh, and another great company called Rally Software out of Boulder, mm -hmm. um, recently also sold to CSC, ironically. And um, basically, the way that it came about is because in like 2008, just before everything crashed, Google was a big win for us. So Mark knows the founders of Google went down there, they heard him talk about 111. They said, we want to do this in our company. And so I went down and met with their executive team before their IPO. We sort of joke, it was my best two days ever on the job. And I went down and I sort of taught them how do, the, how do you move your equity over, what are the legal structures for that. And then they had their IPO and they went from zero to a billion dollars in their foundation on the first day of their IPO. Amazing outcome. So the, so the guys and I uh, from Google sort of went around the Silicon Valley in 2008 and said, every company should do this, right? And I'm going to stop you a second. Yes. I, I want to get really clear on what this is. Okay, the so, equity set aside. Yeah, so can we, can we define the three ones? Sure. Let, let's, let's start with the first one, donating 1% of, pro, of product. What, what does that look like? Well, it depends what you do. So Silverline, who we talked about, there's a team here, they do uh, consulting technology services. So their donation, which they did on Sunday, which was to donate their their product, which is their people, basically in a services firm, to take their volunteer, for them it's kind of volunteer time and product are the same, okay. right? Because it's a services industry. Um, in our case, it's software, right? right? So we give our software to nonprofits, uh, many of whom use it for fundraising or outcomes management. Right, okay, yeah. so the second one is this notion of pledging 1% to an equity package. Yes. What what literally does that mean? Yes, and that is what entrepreneurs. That's why I, that's why working with entrepreneurs has been awesome. So that's stock. That's equity. That's when you found your company. Really easy to do when you're just doing your founding documents because you can say I own ninety nine percent and the community owns one percent. Mm. Right. You take that. You can just write it in your founding documents and worry about it later. Um, Twilio, a company that went public last year, they took a percent of their equity. Um, so did Yelp, most people know Yelp. They did it more like series CD. So they had to get their venture capitalists to approve it. The VCs are not blocking it. They were blocking it when Google and I went ar around in 2008, but they're not blocking it anymore. But basically you take your shares from your employee pool and these guys often, because they were later stage companies, 
sort of said we will exercise them over a three to five year period so it doesn't dilute the pool as much. Okay. And then the third it, one is 1% 1 of profit or employee time. Right. Okay. Some people do profit, right, if they're a profitable company. Some people do four 1%s, include they tackle, they did the equity and now they do profit. Um, I think Atlassian actually does that. And uh, the time is just paid time off. You don't accrue for it, so your CFO will ask you, should I accrue for it? The answer is no, it's use it or lose it. But many companies, especially the next gen companies, don't even have PTO anymore, um, paid time off. So they basically just enable people to go do volunteerism as part of their jobs. Are you, are you seeing a trend here where on the third one, companies are choosing more often than not to go with the people part rather than the profit part? So, and how do you encourage them? Because both are valuable, right? All are valuable. I totally get that. Yeah. But I would imagine that the community would feel like the dollars are probably the most valuable. Maybe. I don't know. Because, and I was just talking um, to Dennis, I don't know where he went, but he's been doing the AV and he's a marketing consultant. He's been working with HubSpot um, and bringing that into nonprofits. And the reason that I think that product is super powerful for them or Salesforce, we have this thing called the Impact Cloud, which is a collaboration between DocuSign and Box and Salesforce and Splunk. And basically, you, you would pay a lot of money for those services, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we're able to donate them for nonprofits. And they, they, as a nonprofit, you're able to do tracking, right? On your fundraising, you're able to do storage with Box. So you're getting stuff for free, right? But then you're getting people like the Silver Lines and Tyrum Fusion and Accenture and some of our consulting partners to do that implementation in a nonprofit. And often, like I was in the nonprofit sector, we did not have a technology person. Like we did not, like we could not afford a technology person. So you're getting actually hundreds of thousands of dollars in products and services. Um, in some cases, it's more valuable than cash. So is it one or one or one, or is it all three for an organization? In order it's to whatever you want to do. So, and I hope that some people take the pledge. It's super easy. You can do it on your phone. The shocking thing to me about it has been we thought everyone was going to do time, like you said. Like, that's kind of the easiest one to check the box on. We have 1,800 companies in the last 16 months who have signed up for Pledge 1%, 18 months, really. Um, 72% of them did the equity set aside. And mm. I was shocked about that, actually. I was not expecting that. Yeah. Have, uh, can you Snap. think of Look at Snap. Snap yeah. IPO was just, and they did an equity set aside. It's becoming the new way to do business. How is that process audited? Does Pledge 1%, I know Pledge 1% has three full-time employees. Do they have a, an auditing function where organizations that take the pledge are self-reporting, or they send documentation each year? to fill out and, and send back in? Yeah. How does that part work? Yeah, you know, it's not, I, we don't audit. We think it's karma. I think it's karma. Um, I think you either do it or you don't do it. At some level, we know that a large majority of these companies are gonna be out of business anyway in five years. So while you're around, right, do great work while you're here. A lot, we hope, will be successful and go public, like the Twilio's or Yelp's of the world. Right. Um, but that we just know the, we know the startup failure rate also. So, you know, we think people are gonna take the pledge. They'll do it, there's no real advantage. I mean, sure you can use the branding on your website, but if somebody asks you and calls you to the mat, like a nonprofit, you can search as a nonprofit uh, in your geography, kind of who are my pledge 1% companies, and if you call them and say, well, what can you give me, and they say nothing, they'll probably come back around and sort of report them to us, but it's not sure. happened yet. Yeah. What's the downside of corporate giving at this level? Um, I mean, there, there's so much on the positive side for community, but is there something that the organization that's taking the pledge that you've seen, maybe they didn't quite understand, oh, we have to do that? Or is, is there a downside? I, I don't want to assume that there isn't. Yeah, it's a good question. I couldn't figure out how to answer this question. I mean, I think the only thing is if you do it from a marketing perspective, that is not a good idea because it needs to be real. It needs to have real legs underneath it. Doing philanthropy for marketing purposes is just not real philanthropy. Um, at least we don't think so anyway. And I, you know, I think the, I, I think what I just want to say is in addition to the sort of 
time product equity. We've been very vocal in a lot of social issues. So I actually think that you can drive social change outside of traditional philanthropy. Like we've been very focused on equal pay for women, you know, and we're, that's another thing companies can do is they can support policy changes locally and nationally. Um, we've been very um, active on equal rights around, especially LGBT rights. North Carolina. North Carolina, right? Yeah. We just, we were about to pull all out of Indiana when that went down. So I just think you can leverage your company for social change. In addition to these kind of giving areas, also, the, the one other example that I just think is really important for people here to know about is how you hire. Like, so I don't, I look at every department in the company and say, what can you do to drive social change? And like finance is like, yeah, we don't know. And tech's like, we don't know. But when we did IT, when we were hiring, we, t we at one point had a tur um, high turnover rate with our help desk folks. And instead of solving it through like a university recruiting program, we solved it through a social program called Year Up, which trains 18 to 25 year olds in technology skills and help desk in particular. And so we, and these are kids that aren't on your typical path to college, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we hired them. Actually, the CIO said, I said, can you bring on one or two year up kids? And she said, I'll take 15. And I was like, I don't even know if there's 15 in the first graduating class. They were new to the Bay Area. And so that's, so those kids now we've converted, we've, God, had three or 400 in our company. We've converted 65% of them to full-time employees. They start as contractors. Their loyalty is incredibly high. Their turnover rates are really low. Uh, and they, they tend to be promoted faster. So I think you just had to think about your company broadly um, in addition to sort of your, your kind of donations. Yeah. There's a, there's a policy implication here too, isn't there? Um, we're talking about integrated corporate philanthropy. And it's one thing for the CEO's office to say it. It's another thing to have a foundation. But I'm going to ask you to put your, your bureaucrat hat on yeah. and your policy writing hat on. What are the tentacles that need to be um, inserted out into the organization at the policy level so that this notion of integrated corporate philanthropy really does take hold? I mean, it sounds like it's an issue that impacts HR. It's an impact that, that Im impacts or something that impacts uh, every division of the organization. Yeah. But it's one thing to say we're going to do this and force it on people. It's another to develop policy at the board level and then have staff adapt it and, and massage it. What kind of challenges did you have to go through or did you not because you were so young that it was just baked right in? Yeah, we didn't do, we're now, I just rewrote the corporate giving program uh, policy from 2006 <laughs> last week. So we actually policy was less important to us because we were startup, we practiced it. It's all about do you practice what you preach? So we had a policy for paid time off. When we had paid time off, we no longer do for certain levels of the company. So we did some structural stuff um, on some HR policies around paid time off, uh, policies around product donation. I mean, there was a, there was a few structural elements um, that we changed, but for the most part, we just lived the work. And when you live the work, it goes so much further. And yeah. I guess the, the one thing that I want to say, especially for the smaller, even the, for the nonprofits, for the for-profits, like you guys, should, like everyone, we learned this late, you should know your public schools. And that is living the work. So if you're a two-person company, if you're a 200-person company, like who, my guess is within a two-mile radius, there is a public school near you. The question is, do you know the principal? Are your employees working in that school? Are you bringing those kids to your office? Because somebody said there was a sixth grade class that came over today. That's mm -hmm. awesome, right? That is living the work. So when we were a really small company, we would march over these fourth graders to do reading programs with us once a week, right? It was a very light touch volunteer, one hour um, program that we run. But then those kids grew up. Actually, they're, they're all, and some of them still work for us. It's crazy. So, and like I have two high school kids working like, like for me now. Like they came in for story time. They came in for and story now they're, time. And they're a CSR now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just say no, like it all starts with education. Yeah. And so many public schools are so lacking in resources. Companies have people that can mentor 
And it wasn't even, they read to us. We just sat quietly and listened because third graders need to practice how to read. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, we've been around for 17 years. So some of these kids came back when, we, when they were in high school and they said, we're juniors and seniors. We remember you because we used to march over to your offices every Tuesday. Do you guys have any internships for summer uh, kids? And we were like, no, but we should. Do you want to come work here? And then we just sort of invented jobs for them. And now yeah. it's a structured program. So we went opposite policy. We sort of, sort of what we were talking about with tactics and strategy. Mm -hmm. We tried stuff and then developed policy around it versus starting with policy. And this kind of brings us full circle for why you're here, right? Yeah. Because you have an opportunity here to reach people that are thinking about starting businesses yep. are in those early stages where it's not as complicated to bring something like this in-house when you have 15 or fewer employees. Right. Or none, for that matter. Or none. Just yeah. Yet. Yeah. Okay. And when you're doing your founding documents, when you're especially when you're a, just a small company, if you when you're writing your uh, when you're putting together your LLC, you just can say, "I want to give one percent back to the community." So on that note, pledge one percent. There's a website. It's the word pledge one percent spelled yep. out, the numeral one, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, dot org. What kind of resources does pledge one percent offer? to entrepreneurs that are just getting started. Yep. In, in terms of helping them to set policy and, and set the, all these different things in motion. Yeah, so if you do, by the way, if you're already doing cool stuff, which most people are, um, you can contribute. So it's kind of crowdsourced resources. So there's volunteer paid time off policies on there that you can give to HR. There's equity set warrant transfer agreements, which is how do you do your stock set aside? All fill in the blank. All fill in the blank, yep. ready, right? Ready to give to your attorney. Ready to give yeah. to your attorney. There's all those kind of templates that we just stamp draft on and put up for other people to use. That's terrific. And also for like the entergies of the world and the bigger companies, like Virgin just signed up as a pledge 1% company. Virgin, Entergy, you guys have been doing this work for years. We've learned a lot from the bigger companies what we were asking from all of you, and um, Patty said you guys have been doing it from since 2005, is to just add your name to the effort because we know that when we get good brands that say I'm a pledge one percent company, people will that will matter for people. So again, Virgin has been doing this probably before we started, and they just called me and they said, "Can we join pledge one percent?" And I was like, "Absolutely." So it's right. kind of legitimizing what they've already done. Right. Yeah, and it's pulling people together to share best practices. Yeah. Do you ever think there'll be a Pledge 1% user conference or event, an annual event where people will gather, they'll get to share their success stories, there'll be awards that are handed out? Or is it really not about that? Is it about you do what you do really well, we just want to serve as a resource for everybody? I don't know. We've talked about that. To be honest, I want to go out of business with this effort. In five, my goal is to shut this thing down in five years. Okay. Um, I don't think enough nonprofits have a vision for an exit strategy. I was really worried about starting a new nonprofit. I don't want to do biggering. I want to get into the Y Combinator founding documents. I want to get into all the attorneys. I want to get into the venture capitalists. I want to get to all the entrepreneurs. And I want to make this the new normal for business. Mm -hmm. And then we're done. Like that is the ultimate game. So we maybe within the next five years, sort of before we go out of business, we'll bring everyone together. Yeah. But the ultimate goal on this is it becomes the new normal when you start your company. Yeah, you're, you're, you want to increase the number of subscribers to the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Right. You That's want, right. Yeah, you want them. Okay, I get that. Yeah. So l let's turn our attention locally and also to something that's a, a little bit of a passion of yours. So in, in August of 2005, everyone knows that Hurricane Katrina barreled into the Gulf Coast. Um, the force of the storm and the ensuing collapse of federal levies uh, surrounding New Orleans, they caused 1,800 deaths, damaged 500,000 homes, yeah. displaced more than a million people, and cost more than $150 billion in damages all along the Gulf Coast, according to figures that were compiled by the data center here in New Orleans um, and the city of New Orleans itself. It, it remains the costliest uh, natural disaster in our, in our country's history. Um, what are your thoughts on environmental justice? We, we've talked a lot about we actually haven't talked about it, but we've alluded to the notion of social justice. Right. Um, as it relates to environmental ju justice, we know that a lot of organizations pitched in to help New Orleans rebound. Right. But um, what are your thoughts specifically on environmental justice, and what would you want folks here to know um, about that effort as it relates to your personal causes 
um, or what Salesforce is concerned about? Yeah, so our, you know, our mantra as a company is equality for all, right? So we've been working, I talked about equal pay, I talked about LGBT rights, I talked about philanthropy. I think, and I just changed, so I don't run the .org anymore. I now have a new job in the company, which is sort of stakeholder management more broadly, this sort of broader umbrella. And I took over the environmental program very specifically because I think it's, a, a, I actually think it's a human rights issue. It's a social justice issue. Obviously the people, I so mean. So it factors into equity. Totally factors into equity. Um, and for, for two specific reasons. One, because when a natural disaster happens, almost always um, the sort of poor or underserved uh, people are in, they're always affected most, right? So that was true in New Orleans, that was true in New York, that was true, it, that's true globally, right? Every time there's a natural disaster, people with resources can get out and can rebuild fast. People without access to resources cannot. So we're gonna start, and we have been seeing more environmental um, climate change based disasters, so that's one. And the second is just because um, globally in particular, but even locally, access to clean water. That is another thing, for example, that affects people without resources in an inordinate way than it does to people with resources. Even in San Francisco where I live, there's a neighborhood called Bayview Hunters Point and um, a lot of the low income folks live in that neighborhood and it's like toxic as hell. The, like the land is toxic. They're doing all this, the Navy's doing all this remediation, but it was a toxic site. So I just think that for the two reasons, natural disasters and sort of environmental um, failures, right, actually impact people without means way more so than they do people with resources. So that's why I think it's a social issue. It makes sense. So to wrap up before we go yep. to Q&A, you know, we, we can't have a conversation about corporate social responsibility and corporate giving in 2017 without talking about sort of that elephant that's in the room. Um, and, and not to offend anyone on either side of the aisle, but this time around, it happens to be a GOP elephant. Um, what impact does the election and the administration of President Trump have on philanthropy? And what should the role of the corporate community be when we're hearing about really, really drastic cuts that are coming to, um, to many important programs? It's scary, I mean, it's scary to me. I, I, every day I read about, I look at the education cuts, $2.5 billion Department of Ed. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's scary and I think corporations need to fill in the gaps like this, everyone should know a school within walking distance, right? right? So I think we can help on a mentoring perspective. I think we can jump in in some cases where the government has played a role. And then the other area, so my CEO was just at the White House on Friday and he was there talking about jobs. So there's this whole thing to bring jobs back to America. Our company has spent a billion dollars in AI acquisitions over the last 12 months. So everyone is kind of scared about artificial intelligence. Anyway, artificial intelligence. Yes, and how that is gonna impact jobs, driverless cars, I mean, you name it, right? So we're focused a lot on retraining, reskilling um, of the workforce and bringing in sort of non-traditional workers, veterans, we have a huge program for veterans. We've got $54 billion going into the military. There's a whole lot of people that are gonna be coming home, right, that need training that need um, support. And so we've been putting, uh, we've been focused on jobs in the new administration. We can get behind that issue. We think it's real uh, and we think we can make a difference. Awesome, well Suzanne, on yeah. behalf of Ideal Village, um, today's sponsor, thank you so much for being here. Sure. We've got Super a few fun. moments for, for Q&A and I think there are some microphones out if, if folks want to uh, ask some questions, Suzanne would be happy to answer. Sure. Hi Suzanne, um, so I had a quick question on you work in an industry where... Could, I'm sorry, could you tell us your name and uh, a little bit about your background, who you're with? Yeah, my name is Peter Haas. Uh, I work in robotics at Brown University. I've done many startups. Um, I also used to work in the nonprofit field. Um, so my question is, you're, you're in an industry that has very few negative social impacts. Um, I mean, Salesforce is a great product, but it doesn't really uh, do anything bad in the world. What is the danger of companies that actually do have a lot of negative social impacts taking up your motto and using it as 
uh, a greenwashing uh, type of platform uh, to cover up how much cleaning up of the company's own mess does it have to undertake before it goes into CSR? Yeah, it's a good question. So two things on that. First of all, we have data centers. So like we have to mind how we run our data centers um, to provide a clean cloud. And we're very focused on that. And plus we rent them, we don't own them. So we're really like kind of have the hammer on our data center providers to we've joined this thing called the Colo Principles, which is to provide green data centers, but they suck a ton of energy. So we've been working really hard with other um, renters of energy to, to change that industry. So it's not that we don't, it, we don't manufacture things, but we do have, if we're not intentional, right, we could, our, our service could be not uh, well used from an energy perspective. But for the manufacturers, like I, I think who I would use is like Unilever is a great example of a manufacturer who has gone up and down their supply chain, kind of looking at um, in the, all different parts of their business, how are they sourcing their materials, how are they sourcing their goods. So I think I see personally less greenwashing than I did 10 years ago. Um, and part of that has to do with the second thing I was gonna say, which is a company called Just Capital, which is out of New York. Um, and they're gonna be, they're just started, they're about a year old, and they're a rating system. It's sort of like Yelp for companies. And they're gonna, company CSR, right? So their job, what they wanna do is bring transparency to companies that are maybe not sourcing responsibly or not looking deeply in their supply chain or manufacturing with child labor somewhere, right? Like Apple, I work a lot with Apple. Lisa Jackson is a good friend of mine who runs their CSR program. It's tricky for a company like Apple because sometimes they don't even know their vendors, vendor, 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 right? You gotta go seven levels deep and that takes a lot of work. So they are a company that actually tries to do that pretty well, so is, does Unilever. But Just Capital, I think, is gonna expose the companies um, that, that do it for marketing or greenwashing purposes. Certainly, I hope they are. And you know, to, to his question, to Peter's question, there was a study done in 2014 about corporate social responsibility by University of California, Riverside, their business school, and the London Business School. And they found that for every five corporate social responsibility acts that a corporation makes, they make one, either knowingly or unknowingly, corporate social irresponsible act. And it's almost as if the, uh, the five acts give you license to do the others is what they say. Um, and so having an organization um, that looks after that greenwashing is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. Greenpeace um, pro provides a report called the Clean Cloud Report. I mean, I track that because we're a cloud-based company. But there's been a number of, uh, they, there's dirty clouds and the clean cloud. So there, I, I kept seeing more and more people that are trying to bring transparency and sort of expose the, you know, the people who are doing it for the wrong reasons. Great, Thanks. do we have time for Good another question. question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Keith Twitchell. I run a nonprofit here called the Committee for a Better New Orleans. Could you talk a little bit more about how the 1% the equity set aside translates directly into supporting, supporting social change and community work. Sure, so the equity turns into cash. Uh, so Twilio, who just went public, um, the numbers they're currently using on their stock value is $30 million. So uh, that will change over time when the stock price changes. They'll be in lockup on some of that and I think they're gonna exercise it over three years. So equity, equals cash. Workday is another, Yelp is another. Those two companies cumulatively, it's about a hundred million dollars as a result of their IPO. So the equity part of like the stock, it's sort of like your employees get rich, your early employees. Part of it is to try to get the community to have some benefit on the cash. So, so that's the equity part. They're, they're almost like donor authorized funds. Right. Who holds that, who holds that for, does the, does Trilio, Yelp, and others, do they identify a local community organization to hold those warrants? Yes, so uh, when you're an early stage company, you don't even have to worry about it because your stock isn't, it's like doesn't mean anything. You don't have any employees yet to give it to. Um, when you're a later stage company, the community foundations are a really good resource. So Boston Community Foundation, Tides Foundation, they operate globally. They'll hold your equity for you. Um, 
which isn't real. It's just a piece of paper that says we pledge to give you equity. Um, that's how it works. But we're working with the community foundation is the best way to do it. Is that like how the Gates Foundation is doing the same with Warren Buffett and others? trying to get them to make donations and hold on to that? Yeah, I think they do it through their family offices, largely. Okay. It's more of a public commitment. Yeah. Um, the community foundations come into play, like with DocuSign. We sold our stock pre-IPO. So did Lookout, who's a cybersecurity company. So you can sell it on the secondary market before you go public if you want to raise cash, which we needed to do because we had staff in our foundation at a young age. So there's a way to make it liquid before it's illiquid. So hopefully that answered your question. But it's a long term, it's a long tail thing. And again, pledge1percent.org can be a great resource. Great for resource for that. And that. Snap's IPO was, I forget how many million, but they staged theirs over like 13 years or something. Okay. In the back, yeah. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm uh, with Accenture actually. Um, and I was just curious if you could give a few examples of other companies that you see that are maybe pushing the boundaries beyond philanthropy um, in the technology space, whether through working with startups or otherwise, um, you know, integrating more into core business? Yeah, you know, a funny answer to that, not a funny answer to that question, but an odd answer to that question that I've been really impressed with as of late is two companies. One is IBM, right? You think of IBM as sort of an old school company they are doing incredible stuff. Um, I, I've been working with them a lot on their kind of veterans program. Some of the health work they're doing with Watson is really interesting and amazing. Um, another one that I would say that is sort of um, another old school, I can do a million young companies that most of you have never heard about, um, but just a, from a brand name perspective, Accenture does crazy good things, especially with your ADP program over, overseas, which is awesome which is called Accenture Development Partners, which is fantastic. But another one is GE. Um, and GE, I think, has an innovation center here in New Orleans. But um, they have been doing really interesting kind of out in front innovation, uh, I think, fr from the, on the energy side, for sure, um, but also in workforce development. And so I see them as an old school company that continues to sort of innovate. Where do you see, um organizations that have signed up for B Corp. Um, do, do they play in this space as well? Yeah, so B Corp is for for-profits that, uh, that you can, when you're founding your company, you can say, I wanna be a B Corp company, which says, I have a triple bottom line, right? I do things that are also good for the world. Shore Bank, in his example, give something back office products is an example of B Corp. They build it into their, uh, their founding documents and their bylaws, really. They do it from kind of a bylaws perspective. And a lot of, I would say, I, I forget the right number, but over 50% of B Corp companies are also Pledge 1% companies. They also tend to be smaller organizations yeah. too, don't they? Totally. Yeah, they're not thinking about exit strategy the way that. Right, except for like Shorebank. Shorebank's pretty big yeah. and they're a B Corp. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Time for one more question. Ooh, I have to choose Hello, my name is Justina and I'm actually the Salesforce Administrator for a nonprofit called College Track that's actually based out of the Bay Area. And my question um, is you mentioned the failure rate for startup businesses, which is also similar to the failure rate of startup nonprofits. And I've noticed that it's often the multi-million dollar nonprofits that are often connected with philanthropy giving and corporate sponsorships. So what are some suggestions that you have on how startup nonprofits can also um, build their corporate sponsorships and, and giving? Yeah, it's a great question. I love College Track. They're an awesome organization founded by Lorene Powell Jobs um, in the Bay Area. We've worked with them for a really long time. You guys have incredible success um, getting young kids uh, into college, supporting them through college. We've worked with you guys starting in the eighth grade, so kudos to you on great work. So College Track came to us as a startup. Right, when Lorreen sort of had the idea. And so I can you sort of use your own organization, right, as, a, as an example, because now you're pretty big and you've got pretty big scale, uh, including here in New Orleans, right? So um, I think that you have to remember that you don't 
sponsorships. Corporate sponsorships is not going to be, that is like, it goes back to your giving statistics, right? Like, that's 8% of the dollars. Like, you don't act, like, you're not going to get a lot of value if you're trying to, as a startup nonprofit, get money out of corporations. They just don't, ha it's not their strength. But if you figure out, like a, an example is, and I could even use College Track as an example, but one that I was just with recently was this incredible organization doing human trafficking uh, work in the dark web. And um, they came to us and they said, we need, uh, we need AI people, we need uh, security people, we need people that know how to navigate the dark web, we need storage. They asked, they had like a menu, and then they had companies on this side. So on this side, we said, they said, we need people with these skills, and these are, or products, right? Because, and they needed Salesforce to sort of track their fundraising. So they actually were super smart as a startup nonprofit. And even College Track back in the day said, like, we need mentors, and this is the time, and like, this is what, this is what we need from your company. So companies are not that smart, like, in a way as it relates to social issues, if you ask, if you give them a menu and say, I need 16 hours of uh, you know, AI help to figure out a thing or of a security, you know, on your security team to help me kind of navigate the dark, I need a board member. I need a, uh, your product at this cost. Like if you give them the checklist, they will show up. My experience is they will show up for you. And like this human trafficking organization, they're like, we need Google to do this, we need Facebook to look at photos and cross-reference, we need sales. Like they were super thoughtful in what they were asking companies to do. And it was really easy for companies to say, right on, we'll do that. That was super clear and I can show up for you there. But had they come for corporate sponsorships, they would they would have spun around in marketing and then the, maybe in their foundation. And then it's just, it, it's, I think that the, the key is, for startup nonprofits, what help do you need from corporations? Web developers, maybe? I don't know. Like, then you ask for, I need 20 hours of web development time. And then I think companies can really help you. That's probably equivalent to like 50 grand. I don't know. So that, that would be my coaching to nonprofits, startups in particular. College Jack said we need mentors. Well, that's great advice. Yeah. So, Suzanne, thank you very thank much. You. That was thank you. Thank you, Idea Village. and. Entergy for allowing us to be here today. And uh, will you be around for I'm questions right. off stage? Yeah. Great. Thanks. Right. Thank you, everyone. Fun.